Thanks, John, and, and thanks everybody for having me here today. Uh, it's always fun to come out and talk about this. As we were gathering today, we were saying you know, it, it was a big process. It was about 18 months of work leading up to the September 26th launch of Ceasefire Wireless. And as some folks over here at this table remarked, and I'm still smiling, and yes, it's, it's very much invigorating. As John mentioned, um, we live and work in one of the most competitive industries in, in the world. Um, our competitors are two of the biggest spenders in, in advertising, and we have to compete with that every single day. We live where retail, which in its own right, is very dynamic and fast-paced, and telecom meet. So we live at this point right here, and it's this flexion point that becomes this vortex of energy and dynamic competitiveness and just the pace. We can never sit still, and we, we don't see ourselves as a regional carrier, and that's part of uh, what was behind the name change. So I'll tell you a little bit about that, and we'll leave some time at the end for questions as we walk through this. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the backstory uh, of Ceasefire. We've been around for, as, as Cellular South, we've been around for almost 25 years, but the parent company of uh, Ceasefire's Telepac Networks and Telepac, and they started as rural providers of landline service for almost 60 years. And so as you go throughout our region, we've provided some sort of telecommunications for um, consumers for a very long time, and it's very important for us. John also mentioned that we're a privately held company, and that changes the way that we do business in a very big way, and we're fiercely committed to remaining in a privately held company. Um, the founders of our company are in the elevators every day. We see them. And um, if it were just about the money, we would have sold out to AT&T or Verizon or Sprint years ago because they've come knocking a whole lot. And so we don't do that because this guy. This is a stick figure, right? But this guy is in our conference rooms. It sounds a little hokey, but it's part of our culture. So. I'll give you a little sneak peek at that. So this guy is in, he's literally, little stainless steel guys are pinned up in our conference rooms so that as we're making decisions, as we're making those strategic decisions, whether it's pricing or the way our plans are structured or the way we build out our network, we're always thinking about the customer. So I know that sounds trite and a lot of companies can say that, but at Ceasefire, it's very much um, at the core of who we are. So as we look at our name, it's really customer inspired, so ceasefire. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that evolution as we go through. But know that it's very much a part of our DNA, and we don't have to make decisions based on quarterly shareholder reports. It's based on is this the best thing for the customer? Um, Cellular South launched unlimited plans nine years before any other carrier did because it was the right thing to do for the customer. We didn't think people should have to worry about what time of day it is or those sorts of things. So it's all of those decisions are rooted on this customer. So um, a little bit of an eye chart from here, but this is really to start talking about the process. 18 months of process. John mentioned that we worked with one of the um, best brand development companies in the world. We worked with Lippincott. They used to be Lippincott Mercer, but they have um, built and developed brands that have endured for decades. Brands like Amtrak, Duracell, Infinity for cars. They named the beverage Sprite. So if you think about how long those brands have been around and how much a part of our culture they are. We knew that as we embark on our next 10, 20, 30 year history, that we had to develop a brand that was not just superficial, but that it would endure for decades to come. So we went to Lippincott. And we went to them because of all these other brands they had um, worked with and developed. Um, they just redid the Starbucks branding. For example, I've been noticing that around town here. Um, but also because of their process. They're very, very process driven. As a company, Ceasefire is very process driven. Amy will tell you that everything we do, we're always refining our processes and making things better from a systematic standpoint. And Lip and Cut, if you ever need to go through a branding exercise, these guys have their methodology down 
and it works. By the time we got to decision making points, the process had worked the key shareholders through to the point that the decisions were easy because we had worked it all the way through. So um, when we got to decision points of names or logos, there wasn't this infighting or half of the people liking one and half liking the other. The decisions were easy because of the process. So what we really said, and you can't really see it, but there are brackets all the way through, is you start with really what's the brand essence? What are we trying to convey? And then from this essence, you get to this positioning statement. And the positioning statement is never seen externally. It's an organizing and unifying piece that we used internally, and also use some of those pieces. So only then, when you get this strategic framework in place, do we start talking about brand attributes and naming and then logo. So that was like the, the name and the logo, the visual <laughs> external pieces were the last things that we did. Has anybody in the room ever gone through this? So some veterans of, of the process. So, and we knew that all these things had to happen. It really had to, um, you had to be credible and relevant and unique and durable. All of these things. At every checkpoint, we were scrubbing <coughs> options against this list. If it didn't make it, it was out the window. So it was a very rigorous, very um, straightforward, non-emotional process. It was very logical. The emotion came later. <laughs> so on this slide, and it's kind of, it's color coded to kind of help us walk through it, but we talked about the essence. You know, if you had to boil everything down to two words, what do you want the brand to convey? Um, at the same time we were doing this work with Lippincott, we were doing a parallel track working with Yankee Group, who are industry pundits working with advisors at Columbia Business School, really working through the other piece of business strategy. What are our products and services look like? What are they shaped like? What's the supply chain? What's the value chain? And so there were these two parallel paths really going on for these 18 months of this strategy and overall business strategy that had to sync up. So where we landed as a brand essence is we wanted to be inspiringly intuitive. From a business strategy standpoint, there were lots of technical phrases and really industry lingo stuff that would you know, never um, be seen from the outside, but really we had to go through that. But we really ended up saying we wanted to be inspiringly intuitive. We wanted to inspire our customers to do more with their phones. We didn't want them to be intimidated by it. We wanted to inspire them, which we feel is like a, a very aspirational place to be. And intuitive, both from two standpoints. Intuitive that we know enough about our customers and enough about the technology to know what consumers want before they do. And intuitive enough that our products and services are so easy to use that they're intuitive for the consumer. So there's two, two places of intuitive. So then we really boiled it down into these color codes. So what you'll see is, um, Kind of the washed out purple is the audience. Who are we talking to? There's the definition of what's our business? How are we defining our business? There's the differentiation, which we all know without differentiation, you've got really nothing, right? And then what do we deliver? At the end of the day, what are we delivering? So we spent, it's kind of funny to look at it on this slide. You can say, ah, oh, you can knock that out in the afternoon. We spent weeks and weeks getting this just right, of saying, here's what we want to be as a company, because this is the foundation. So when you look at the audience of, for people who want to fully benefit from technology but have not yet tamed it, that was very, we chose each of these words very deliberately, and that we use the word tame technology because we know everybody wants to use their phone differently. You've got smartphone addicts who want to know every whiz-bang element of you know, the highest end usability of a phone. And then you have some people who say, I'm not really sure where to go find an app. So taming it was really a personalized, a very individual take on technology, because taming it for a smartphone addict is entirely different than taming technology for somebody who's the first time they picked up a smartphone. So we really, for the audience, we, wanna, we really want to talk to those people who want to benefit from it, but not 
you know, they just don't know how to tame it. Like you tame a lion, right? You're not making it unwild. You're just getting it to do what you want it to do. So this is really, you'll start to see this notion of personalized kind of ferret out throughout this process. So then we look at what's the definition. So at this time we were still saying cellular south because beyond about six people in the company, nobody really knew what we were really doing. So all of these documents still say cellular south. So cellular south is the wireless communications, multimedia, and social networking provider committed to uniquely relevant intuitive innovation. Okay, that's something we would never say externally, right? It's a lot of industry speak, but internally, it helped us as we're looking in this parallel track of what do we bring to market? What do we deliver? If it didn't fit this blue sentence, we didn't do it. So you'll see multimedia, you know, we have programs like the Bright Lights Football, Bright Lights Music. We really want to meet people in different places. And social media is vitally important for us. Over time, we've really moved to more digital uh, delivery of a lot of advertising mm -hmm. and social is the same place. We want to meet consumers where they are instead of making them come interact with us. So we've developed, um, for example, customer care interaction so that as consumers are in the Facebook environment, they don't ever have to leave Facebook, but they can still chat with our customer care representatives while they're in Facebook and get their answers um, resolved in a private way while they're still within their social networking space. So that some of those kinds of things, you know, were lifted from the blue sentence. So that we really lift these individual segments of the positioning statement out and really deliver strategies against those. And if they don't fit, we don't do it. So then the next thing is the green of differentiation. Thoughtfully designed products and personalized services. The personalized, again, is something that over research, we did research, qualitative and quantitative research in multiple markets from Huntsville to Nashville to Memphis and Jackson and Gulf Coast. So we were in multiple markets and no matter the methodology, whether it was qualitative or quantitative, no matter the market, the same emotion kept coming out of consumers that they wanted to feel special. It sounds kind of simple, and it sounds kind of basic, but it was served up from the voices of consumers in every iterative piece of research we did. So it was really pointing us to how do we personalize, because people weren't feeling like they were getting that anywhere, including from us. So that was a really important piece for us. And then that we integrate technology into your life with amazing ease and effectiveness. If it's not easy, if people have to work too hard, they're not gonna do it. So we always do a gut check against this. So this was really foundational. And we spent a lot of time, a lot of hours locked in rooms with our CEO and our COO and a couple other key people really nailing down each and every word of this, and it continues to, to guide our strategic thinking today. So that's kind of the, you know, the nuts and bolts. And then, once we get through that, then we start to get to the visual stuff and the more consumer-facing things. But first, we said, you know, what's our personality? What are our brand attributes? And as you look across them, they are in order for a reason. And Amy will hear me quizzing people in the hallways that I'll, you know, I'll stop somebody in the hallway. <laughs> brand attributes, what are they? And people are like, you know, they'll start to name them out of order. And I'm like, no, they're in order for a reason. Um, on the left side, you'll see words clear and bold. Those are things we felt like as a Cellular South brand, we already were. And we wanted to bring those things forward. And in the middle, committed. We've always been committed. There's that customer image, the customer stick figure. And we felt like we've always known that internally, but maybe we didn't get credit for that externally. So we said, let's keep that, <coughs> excuse me, but we need to dial it up. The right side of the page, magnetic, fresh, and bright, are those aspirational brand attributes that we said, you know, as a brand of Cellular South, we don't think we were these things. You know, we kind of got put in boxes of, you know, staid or dull or boring or too corporate. And so in our industry, magnetic 
is very important because the penetration rate, depending on who you ask, is between like 98% and 106%. So that's how many people have a cell phone today. And the 106 gets you for people who have, you know, personal <coughs> work blackberries or personal in a data card or that kind of thing. But in that environment, there aren't that many new customers. You know, you've got nine-year-olds getting phones for the first time or the people who finally give in who've been reluctant to, okay, I have to have one of those cell phone things. But mostly it's a zero-sum game, right? We have to attract customers from other carriers. So we have to be magnetic. We don't want to go chase them. We want to be magnetic enough that we're attracting those customers from other carriers. So magnetic is really important. <laughs> Fresh, you see words like contemporary, inspiring, you know, those inspiringly intuitive kind of circles back here. So all of these things start to work together. And then bright really informs our tone and communications. It informs our creative. It informs the way our new stores are being built. So these are very much, you know, we've got the positioning statement and all the color codes to make sure we're making the right decisions. And we've got these posted all over the offices too, so that as we're crafting communications, as we're working on new creative, we bounce it up against this. Like our creative briefs in, inside, our internal ones that we use, and with our agency as well, we've got the brand attributes, and as we develop the communications for specific tactics, we identify which one do we need to do. So if we're messaging customers about new plans, for example, we want to be clear and we want to be committed. So in those kinds of communications, we dial up that tonality. If we're talking to prospective customers, we may need to be more magnetic and fresh. If we're talking to 18 to 24 year olds about the new iPhone that we just got, we definitely have to be magnetic and fresh and bright. So we use these, but depending on the intent and the purpose of the communication, we dial up and dial down. So we feel like we've got a really good system and we use it. Okay, so then we get into naming. You know, everybody thinks, oh, y'all just you know, jumped right into naming. Well, after we did the positioning and after we did the brand attributes, then we started talking about naming. We looked at 800, over 800 names, really. And they weren't computer generated. They were all human generated based on the things that we just talked about. So then you go through legal availability, which is tough. Then you start looking at, are they linguistically appropriate? Are we saying something goofy in another language? Um, do they fit with the brand attributes? And then the tricky one is URL availability. You know, five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, that wasn't a big deal. We weeded out a lot of options because the URL wasn't available. Or it had to be whatever new name, wireless, or you, it, what, there wasn't just the root name. And we said, nope, it's gotta be just the root name. Um, where we landed though in the name, um, the URL was not available and there was unanimous just love for this new name. We're, we're like, we've got to have this name. What can we do? So we have our lawyers contact the people who owned it. Turned out to be a company called Tishman Spire. If anybody's in real estate, you probably know that name. And um, they, there's a building in New York called City Spire, and Tishman Spire happens to own it. They also happen to own buildings like Rockefeller Plaza, <laughs> some other landmarks. So when we're calling and going, hey, can we buy this URL? They're like, are you kidding? You know, we're not even talking to you. We don't have time for this. And so we were at this dead end. And we're like, what? We want this name. So we were like, okay, who do we know who might know somebody at Tishman Spire that will at least talk to us? Uh, so our advertising agency is Young and Rubicam in New York. So we call up our, our agency guys and say, hey, you don't know anybody at Tishman Spire? So they get their real estate people to call Tishman Spire. They sold us the URL for a dollar, for one dollar. It was like the biggest day. I mean, it was like the most emotional day of the entire brand name change. <laughs> Because we all, from our CEO to all the family shareholders, 
to the other four or five people who were involved at this point, we wanted this name and we didn't think we were going to get it. it. It was like, what is that Eddie Murphy movie where they do the bathroom trade for a dollar? Trading, pla trading places? It was kind of like that. So we got it. We got it for a dollar. So this shows that relationships matter. You know, without our relationship with YNR and without their relationship with Tish and Spire, we would have had, we wouldn't be C Spire, we'd be something else. So that was, that was fun. So we go through all these 800, we narrow it down, we started looking at um, different categories that we could look at names. Um, discovery, this notion of innovation and being smart. The middle bucket is some link to the Cellular South brand, this intuitive and this personal. And as we were gravitating toward personalized wireless, we thought personal might be the way we went. But um, our CEO, Humina, is, he's one of those people that every week when I'm working with him, I'm like, dang, you know, I should have thought of that. He's just such a visionary leader and is always ahead of everybody else in the room. It's like that um, TV commercial that says our rock stars aren't like other people's rock stars with the guy who invented the USB. I think he was like our rock star. It's like, you know, he is always thinking three steps ahead and he's the one who came and said, you know what, our customer is the focus. We have so much brand equity in the name Cellular South, and the, our customers had such a high affinity for our brand. We do brand tracking studies every year. Um, our customers love us. You know, our problem is that we had the Velcro that we would keep customers, but we were having trouble attracting the new ones. So we didn't want to alienate our current customers in any shape or form. So we said, you know what? We want to have some link to Cellular South. So we, when we looked at names, we went from this 800, narrowed them down, and then really looked in the bucket of names that had some links. So we've got CS, Cellular South, C Spire, Customer Inspired. So that's really how we went from 800 down to where we landed. All right, so then we start looking at the visual identity pieces. So we've got the positioning statement, we've got the brand attributes, we've got a name, we're C Spire, so then what does that look like? What does that start to look like to consumers? So we did a quick little audit, we looked at, you know, what, is, what does everybody else look like and we want to stand apart. While we had the link and the name to Cellular South, we felt very strongly about keeping some element of blue. You know, as you look around the color wheel, all the other guys are in different categories, so we wanted to stay blue. Um, it also harkens back, a little piece of history, is our first phone call, our first wireless phone call was made between Archie Manning and Trent Lott from the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. So there's some affinity for us in water and blue. So um, that's where we, honestly, why we ended up in, in the blue world. So looking at everybody else, we said we've got to stand out, but at the same time we've got to look as big and national as they do. This is kind of an eye chart from here, but this is a wall in the Lippincott Studios, and you can see the logo option literally wrapped around three walls in their office of directions that we could have gone from a logo perspective. And I think if you look in there, like right there is where we planted, but we could have chosen any of those others. But by the time we narrowed it down to 10 and then 5 and then 3, it was really unanimous across the board. So we landed on C Spire. We, uh, one thing that really drew us to this was that illumination, that hit of brightness that's around 9 o'clock in, in the Spire. We really felt like that was, if you think back to the brand attributes, it really brought through that element of brightness. We felt like it had some magnetism and really drew us in. So we're really pleased with how this turned out. We feel like when we look at the C Spire logo against other carrier logos that it really, really holds up in, in a national scope. So really excited about that. And this is just a real snapshot of how it's kind of playing out against other elements. You'll see our new stores as we start to build those out. Uh, so I think some of the Memphis stores are scheduled for like a June into October time frame. So they all have this blue architectural icon or archon on the building <coughs> and you'll see how it's played out against shopping bags and mobile elements and website and that sort of thing. So it's a very um, unified 
look. Um, it doesn't have any secondary colors, and I know creative teams have kept trying to put secondary colors in, but it changes the tone of the brand completely, so there is no secondary color. There's um, a bright blue, a medium blue, and a dark blue, so it's blue. <laughs> I think we are bumping up on time. I could talk for a long time about Perks and Scout and other things that support the brand. Um, I will tell you that Perks is our rewards program. That is the only rewards program in the wireless industry. We did that because we listened to customers and heard them say, you know what, you do all this stuff to attract new customers. You give them special pricing. What have you done for me lately as a loyal customer? So we have the only rewards program in the wireless industry that is and it's specifically designed to say thank you to our customers and that we appreciate them. Uh, we've awarded over 24 million perk points as of today and have a very high um, adoption rate of the program and we're really excited about it. and think it really differ differentiates us as a brand. So I will, I could talk forever about this, but I will stop and um, answer any questions you might have. When you say personalized wireless, what's the like, two sentence, what does that mean? Personalized wireless delivers what you need personally. So if that's a plan that you can shape to fit your needs, or if it's Perks or Scout, which is our app that gets to know you more than what other apps you have um, and delivers specific app recommendations to you. So it's really three things. It's Perks, Scout, and our infinite data plans. Yes. You know, we didn't, and we had a lot of conversation about that. Um, we definitely didn't want it to be this top-down, kind of we're pushing this on everybody, but confidentiality was absolutely upmost, um, and we really wanted to keep it under wraps as much as possible until launch day, and so that decision was made not to expand it beyond a very core group of people. But we had a lot of conversation about it. What we did do, though, was before we announced that we were actually changing the brand, um, probably four months ahead of time, we started talking about pieces of the strategy and unveiling and including all levels of the organization in understanding the strategy and the products and services and just left the reveal of the brand change to the very end. So we did include all levels along the way. They just didn't know what the brand was changing. But it's a tricky, it's a very tricky situation. Yeah. You kind of touched on my question, but I was curious what the reaction was of your employees to the, to the name change. Okay, so the question was what was the reaction to the, of the employees? Overall, I think at first some people um, were like, why didn't you let me in earlier? I think there was a little bit of that. I think there was a little bit of people who had been around for a really long time of what have you done to my brand? And then I think once they got used to it, I've heard nothing but positive comments and people say, I just, I love the name, it makes me feel excited, I love everything that is coming out. So overall, the response has been very, very positive from an employee standpoint. And from a um, consumer standpoint, we've done 45 day and 90 day brand studies that are quantitative and our awareness levels and linkage to personalized wireless are through the roof. So we're really excited about that too. All right, any other questions? What's your target, um, your customer base? I know that you know, have the word South in it for so long, kind of makes people think that it's just for this area. What, what's your target now, everywhere? Right now, our geographic location of our customers are still Mississippi and Memphis and Mobile, Alabama, from a physical standpoint. We do have spectrum, wireless spectrum purchased eastward, so we do have expansion plans, but we do see ourselves in the national arena along with Verizon and Sprint, and that our customers really don't have any boundaries. So our customers are there, but we see our services as a nationwide service. So are you see yourself getting there, or you see yourself as there? We see ourselves there as a brand, from a customer geography standpoint, we're still limited, but as a brand, we don't we see ourselves on the same level. But as for, from a network perspective, if I signed on tomorrow and I'm in Los Angeles, is that a problem? 
No, not at all. Not at all. Your phone, our, our customers' phones work around the world. And I think Jeffrey can tell you that. Yeah, we work around it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes? There's no more expensive and risky proposition for a company to do than to change from an established brand to a new brand. Mm -hmm. How much money did you budget for this transition? And how soon do you plan to make that? We budgeted about three and a half times our normal budget for that time of year. Um, I don't know that we have looked at it specifically from when does a quantitative ROI turn back on that. We saw it as a long-term investment in brand building and that our former brand just didn't fit our aspirations. So for us, it wasn't a quantitative ROI. It was, we've got to do this to, to ladder up. So I don't think there's been any looking back at all, but I agree it's very, very risky. We knew that there was risk in alienating current customers. So we were very, very high touch with customers. We sent you know letters from Humina directly to consumers. We've um, done a lot of customer communications, but I agree, it's very risky. Yes. Um, this is, uh, on the slide about the naming process, and uh -huh. you showed that one of the filters was linguistically appropriate, easy for you to say. So, with that in mind, how, I know some of the discussion we've had is ceasefire, so I'm so close to ceasefire. I mean, how did that kind of make through the filter of, of that? Yeah, and we have heard a little bit of that uh, chatter wise of, of ceasefire versus ceasefire. We didn't feel like it was a barrier, though, as well, we saw the name as an empty vessel, you know, just like when Verizon launched, really nobody knew what Verizon meant. It was the combination of two words, and it's, it, we see it as a, an empty vessel. So it's ours to make it what it is. And that's why when we first launched the brand, uh, Sam Shepard, who does the voiceover in our TV spots, says the name. So we really wanted to have the name out there very audibly and just give it meaning over time. Yes. It came to be through a lot of dedication and perseverance and really working with the team at Apple to show them that we are not just, just a regional carrier, that we play on the same field as Verizon and AT&T. But it was a lot, a lot of negotiation and a lot of perseverance because we knew that not having that device was a, a real deterrent to market share growth. All right, well, I know everybody has to get back to work. Um, thank you for your time today, and I love talking about this stuff. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks.